So good morning and welcome, and once again to the Insperity Business Resiliency Series webcast. Uh, over the several, past several months, we've used this series to gain a deeper understanding on many of the key topics and trends that small and mid-sized business leaders have been and are facing around the future of work. But for those of us who have lived through the past few years, the notion of attempting to forecast the future has proven to really be an exercise in relative futility. It's been hard enough to simply look out over the next month or the quarter, much less anticipate the twists and turns of the years ahead, particularly in light of the signs of a potential economic downturn in the near term. So without question, the rapid pace of change that the modern workplace has endured has been staggering. And the ability to strategically plan, adapt, communicate, and execute amid this change has proven to be a tremendously difficult undertaking. But here at Insperity, we have this enduring belief that the companies we serve represent the very best businesses in America. And so when we face a period of relative uncertainty, we, we feel that there's no better way to understand both the obstacles and the opportunities that lie ahead for small and mid-sized business leaders than to seek the wisdom of our clients. And so in Q3 of this year, we conducted our business outlook survey, focusing on some of those key trends and themes that are top of mind for our clients when considering the road forward. And today we'd like to share some of those results with you, unpacking many of the issues that each one of us will likely be facing in our unique and specific context. And we'd like to do that by tapping into the expert opinions of both industry consultants and business leaders, approaching the topic from both an overall market trend point of view and through the eyes of one leading their organization from a day-to-day -day perspective. So that's our topic for today, Outlook 2023, Business Insights and Leading Trends for SMB Growth Leaders. My name is Michael Leip, and I'm Managing Director of Brand and Marketing Strategy here at Insperity and the host of the Insperity Business Resiliency Series webcast. And I'm thrilled to be joined by three expert panelists for today's session. Now, let me introduce them for you today. First, let me welcome Meg Whittington, Vice President of Enterprise Analytics here at Insperity. Meg has spent her career helping companies use data and analytics to inform strategy and operations. She is the VP of our Enterprise Analytics function, uh, which works with teams across the company to make sure they have the market and the customer analytics they need for informed and proactive decisions. She has a bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri and a master's in quantitative psychology from the University of Illinois. Thank you, Meg, for joining us today. Good morning, Michael. Hey, good morning. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Bob Simpson, a Senior Principal Communications Consultant in Mercer's Career Business. Bob is based in Houston, Texas, and his experience in change management, digital transformation, and employee communications helps clients roll out engaging, flexible, and measurable solutions for their employees. He received his bachelor's at the University of Texas at Austin and a master's degree in communication management at the University of Southern California. Bob, thank you for your partnership, and it's great to have you with us today as well. Always good to be here. Thank you, Michael. Good. Thank you, Bob. And finally, let me uh, introduce Ben McIntosh, uh, Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel with CC3 Solutions. Ben graduated from the University of Missouri Columbia School of Law in 2006, after which he practiced business law for 10 years before becoming General Counsel of a telecommunications company in late 2016. Ben currently serves as Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel of CC3 Solutions, LLC, a telecommunications solution provider based in St. Louis, Missouri. Ben and the CC3 Solutions team are clients of Insperity, and we're thrilled to have him on our panel today. So, Ben, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today as well. I'm happy to be here and to be considered an expert, which is kind of funny. <laughs> That's great. Well, we'll see how that goes, but I appreciate you uh, and bringing your, your time and your insight today. So, let's, uh, let's jump into our topic, okay? Um, so, Meg, let's start with you. Uh, you and your team here at Insperity conducted the Q3 Business Outlook Survey amongst the a representative sample of, of Insperity's clients. So can you take us through some of the methodology that you and your team use to collect and analyze information? And, and then more specifically, like what are the themes that emerge through that analysis? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, every once in a while, probably once or twice a year, we like to um, go out and talk to our survey, our, our clients, sorry, about um, how things are going for them. Um, not necessarily with their their service with Insperity, but just in terms of operating their organizations and their businesses, um, you know, properly. And so, you know, we did a survey in August of this year to really understand how they're looking at the, the remainder of 2022, but even more importantly, what are they thinking about as we go into 2023? I think we've all seen um, the the news and the all the different um, expert opinions in the marketplace about things that are going on and how are we meant to be planning for, you know, the labor market and the economy and all of these different kinds of dynamics that are that are present in the marketplace right now. 
So we really wanted to understand how our small business clients were responding to that. We uh, got feedback from about 450 clients, and, and these are the people who are owning and operating um, our client businesses. Good. So what are some of the themes that, that came out of that, that analysis? Yeah, it was, it, it was such a great um, survey to uh, get to work on because they absolutely are, you know, making sure that they understand what's going on in the market. They're concerned about the economy. They're looking at um, the labor market and the challenges that's going to be presenting for them. Um, it's just a very, very dynamic situation, which you, you had already talked about. And so, you know, every week there are new reports out in the market from experts talking about, um, you know, th how we should be interpreting all of these different signals from the from the market. So even this week, Bloomberg released um, a data model where they are anticipating um, a 100% a chance of a recession in the next 12 months. And then immediately a lot of economists weigh in and say, well, no, you know, we think it's probably more like 60%. So as a small business owner, that's a really difficult thing to, um, you know, figure out how to navigate. So they're having to be very agile right now and make sure that they're planning for a lot of different types of eventualities. So um, obviously the economic pressures including um, inflation, a lot of supply chain issues um, are really challenging uh, our clients at the at the moment. Um, and then obviously the tight labor market. Job um, openings are increasing faster than hiring are. And this is a dynamic that experts are anticipating is going to continue for a long time. Um, it's a broader market trend. I, I don't necessarily think that's a that's a you know kind of blip that we're living through right now. This is something we're going to be dealing with for a while. Um, and then on top of that, and Bob's going to speak to this, um, the labor force sentiment, people have different expectations about work and their relationship with their employer um, and the way that they work than they did even two, five years ago. Um, so, you know, these are things that when you're running a small business, these are things that are combining to create a very challenging atmosphere for you. Um, but the good news is that our clients are very optimistic about their their ability to navigate through that and still be um, really successful in the coming months. That's great. We're going to dive into that a little bit more here in a minute. And, and Bob, I want to get to you for your analysis. But Ben, I want to start as a client of Insperity. You know, what is your initial response to this summary? Are, are, we certainly are in a dynamic environment. I know that you and your team feel that every day. But are there any of these challenges that maybe you know, are most relevant to you? And, and how are you and your team kind of thinking about managing through some of these challenges? Well, the most relevant to us right now is the tight labor market. Um, as for how we're trying to approach that, um, as for t finding talent, we just try to cast a wide as net as possible. Um, you know, use of LinkedIn, use of Indeed. Um, really the most successful for us has been um, uh, enacting an employee referral bonus. Uh, we really mm -hmm. like to get referrals from existing employees. We've also uh, started to chat with Insperity in recruiting uh, to see if we can't just get that net a little uh, wider. Uh, as for retaining talent, um, there's a saying that the best customer is an existing customer. And I think that kind of applies to employees as well. Keep your current crop of employees happy. Um, we focus on our environment and our, our owners and management, they all come from big corporate America. And so uh, they've seen some of the pitfalls of being too big. Uh, and, and as a, a company with 70 employees, we are small enough to do the little things that I think mean a lot to people. Try to have a flat org chart. Uh, simple things like keeping the ki kitchen stocked with snacks and, and uh, <laughs> drinks, a competitive compensation, of course, um, and benefits monthly recognition calls, holiday parties, mm. uh, barbecues, you know, things of that, Chiefs football games, you know, things of that nature that mm. seem really simple and silly, but they tend to have a lot of purchase with your current crop of employees. Yeah, you, I think you made a great point in the sense of connecting, like even your value proposition as a business, almost to this idea of an employee value proposition where you're, you're working just as hard to keep your 
your great employees as you would trying to keep your great clients, right? So all the things you mentioned are, are all, all great examples of the effort it takes, the intentional effort it takes to, to be competitive in today's market. So Bob, let me turn to you. Um, you, you certainly can resonate with many of the things that Ben has said and, and the, the context that Meg has provided, but you definitely have the benefit of kind of looking over the larger business landscape and bringing that perspective on those themes and then seeing through those themes into certain you know, groups or even subgroups of the, of the larger workforce. So can you unpack that for us a little bit? Yeah, th- we're seeing in a lot of ways, Michael, a snapback on the things that have occurred in 2020 and 2021 and the workforce's reaction to those in a few key ways. First of all, as it pertains to flexibility, and we talked about this, uh, Meg spoke about this earlier, Flexibility is now being tied in, tied in as a core offering when it comes to what attracts and retains talent. Uh, Mercer has traditionally said that the core offerings are compensation and benefits. We now include flexibility within that as well when we speak to our clients about that. Pertaining to that, an answer needs to arise or, or I think uh, uh, there needs to be a greater solution for industries where flexibility and remote work are not the same thing where remote work is not an option for their employees. That is going to be a huge theme over, I think, the next two to three years on providing that type of flexibility for people who are required to be in a certain location. We're also seeing um, a dramatic impact from Generation Z's entrance into the workforce. We're in a, uh, Purdue University did a study and and there's a, there's a, a really interesting state that we're in This is the first time in recorded history that there are five distinct generations in the workforce at the same time, from the traditional pre-1945 generation, which is still about 1% of the workforce, to Generation Z, which is now about 25, 26 years old. We have our first Generation Z member of Congress. This is a a generation that has just shown uh, a dramatic impact, even in midterm elections, where generally young people don't participate. What we're seeing from Generation Z will continue to be very impactful into how biz- and into what businesses uh, do to adapt to their workforce. They are a generation that is bizarrely showing themselves to be quite a bit more like baby boomers than millennials. And we'll continue to see some real advancements. And, and I think they're going to make real waves over the next few years. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's fascinating. Um, and the dynamics of that from being an employer and thinking about the needs and, and delivering upon the expectations for employees across those five different generations is, is, is significant, right? It's a, there's a lot of intentional effort than what you were talking about before. You know, one of the things that I've, I've noticed in Mercer's research is the idea, and, and, and Bob, I may have you dive into this a little bit more, on the idea of trust, the, 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 the idea that companies are going to do the right thing both for society and for their employees. It, that seems to be on the rise, but but in the context of remote environment, that's probably harder to deal with. So, Bob, can you maybe offer a comment there? And then Ben, I want to come to you and, and talk about that idea of trust. Well, I can tell you, Michael, that the idea or really the relationship or the reputation, rather, of an organization has risen dramatically as far as the reason why an employee joins a company. It's still job security or compensation. Those are always going to be you know pretty close to the top. But the reputation of an organization and people's perception of that organization has jumped dozens of places in the last Mm. few years. Mm. People truly value what it is that an organization stands for or what type of forums or opportunities they provide to their employees. So it's become a, 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 I think that's kind of tantamount to what we're seeing from younger generations like Generation Z, which is the first real generation that's been entirely connected throughout their entire existence. They've had internet connectivity um, and they've had the um, ability to get immediate responses and they've had, had the ability to spread messages and spread uh, impressions on organizations much faster than than previous generations. So we've really mm-hmm. seen that that build up. Uh, and and uh, I would say one other thing, Michael, that's really interesting is that we have seen organi- the, the employees' trust in an organization increase also dramatically since 2019, um, which is a, a very, I think, telling response to uh, the pandemic and kind of post-pandemic uh, uh, relationships that employees and employers are having um, as they kind of dealt with that crisis. Yeah, and that's interesting. I'd like to then get your perspective on that. I mean, obviously, trust is is, is paramount to uh, 
to the relate to the relationship that exists between the employer and the employee. Um, what when, when we're going in through this remote transition, uh, I think trust is one of those things that often can be sacrificed on the in the on the altar of efficiency. And so, in my mind, how do we think about building trust within our teams? And what are some steps that you and your team have done to help reinforce that during these times? Well. Uh, with respect to your comment about remote and hybrid work, I, I do think that they make it harder to, to build and sustain that trust. And that's why we've largely avoided it. Um, of, of course, <laughs> we, we have some that do, um, but they are a, a certain category of sales uh, people for us. We're largely a sales organization. And so we have about three different kinds of levels mm -hmm. of, of salespeople, and, and some of those are more uh, equipped to handle remote and hybrid work than others. But lar in large measure, we don't really uh, offer it. Um, and that has a lot to do with our business realities. It's much easier to coach and to train and manage people if they're with you physically. Uh, but it also has as much to do with the kind of culture that we want to have. Our ownership group is largely made up of collegiate athletes, former collegiate athletes, and they put a really high premium on everybody being on the field together. Uh, and so to, to, to further the point, we, we, we try to do those same things that I mentioned earlier um, in building trust, uh, holiday parties, barbecues, uh, competi pumpkin painting competitions, uh, <laughs> sporting events, things like that, we, we're still at a size where those small activities uh, really mean a lot to, to our employees, but we've, we've largely avoided the remote and hybrid work uh, approach. Okay, well, that's interesting, because I, I think a lot of people, if you look at the headlines today, Elon Musk is sort of leading the charge on, you know, mandating this return to the workplace, and it's, there, I think there's going to be some natural uh, friction that, that obviously arises from that, and then your, your context is such that you are your 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 model is built on being together, and you're doing everything you can to make that experience of being together a meaningful one. Not not simply because it's something that man, upper management wants you to do from a control standpoint. So, those are really interesting dynamics, and I think many business owners are still working through that, and and will certainly continue to work through that in the in the days ahead. Um, Meg, let's let's go back to our survey, and I want to you know, go back to the question that we talked about, uh, kind of in our opening around how how our clients have responded in here in the current year of 2022, um, particularly on the idea of business performance. So what, what did our survey reveal around that? Yeah, we always want to understand how things are going for them in the immediate term um, and then also, you know, their future outlook. And what we found is that despite all of the challenges of coming out of COVID and, and this really dynamic market that we're operating in, our clients really feel that they're doing um, even better than they have in uh, the last couple of years, particularly compared to 2021. So, um, you know, over 60% say that their business is performing better than it did last year. We leave that pretty open because we've got a wide range of different kinds of organizations um, from healthcare providers to, you know, startup tech companies. So, so we let them interpret performance of the way that's meaningful for them. Um, but the, you know, then a whole additional quarter say they're at least maintaining their level of performance over over last year. Uh, so again, high degree of optimism. The only time that we've really seen this um, falter at all was in the early days of the pandemic when the level of uncertainty was so profound. Um, but we found that they bounced back and they, they really are feeling like um, they're equipped to deal with uh, kind of whatever comes their way. Yeah. Yeah, so Ben, I want to go. I, I keep wanting to come back to you because I want to have your perspective on on looking at those results and seeing, you know, how does it feel as a as someone operating a company? Uh, how, how is your performance in 2022? Or you know, has it met your expectations? What are the, some of the challenges you and your team are working through? And um, what what are the you know contributing factors that you think are are helping you get to those results? We're a five year old company. We're we're really young, and we're fortunate that 2022 seems to be our banner year thus far. Uh, a lot of that, I don't. I would like to say it has to do with emerging from the pandemic. It could be just we're getting our act together, or uh, we work with a lot of telecommunication providers, 
and we resell their services like internet, mobility, voice over IP, and the like. And so our go-to market strategy largely needs to align with, with theirs in order for us to be successful. Mm-hmm. And um, for better or worse, we've seen our telecommunication provider partners kind of cut down on their sales force, um, which is actually good for us. We are an outside sales force for those telecommunication providers. So uh, they've given us, uh, we more align with them today than we have in the past. And there's been an opening for us this year, whereas in, in years past, um, it wasn't always that case. As for wanting to work with us in particular, I think it does have to do with who we hire, how we train them up. Uh, our training program has been a really big focus for us uh, this year. And, and then until recently, we've had a kind of sink or swim mentality with our sales force, and that resulted in incredible turnover. I mean, in in terms of really, really bad turnover. So this year, uh, the stars have kind of aligned, but I think we owe a lot of that to really investing in our employees and training program has has paid a lot of dividends thus far. That's great. I I think that was an overarching theme that we've touched on throughout the fall is the idea of upskilling your workforce and using that as a primary way to, to fight against uh, some of the talent, you know, difficulties that we're having. It's great to hear that your team is having success there. Um, Bob, I just want to, you know, get your perspective on that. And Meg talked about it. There's the sense of, you know, business and professional resilience that our, our clients tend to embody. Um, you know, these intangible qualities that drive, you know, innovation and discretionary effort from within their team. So, you know, how, from the things you've heard Ben say and the, and the results that Meg has shared, what are, what are some of those things that you see uh, in, in businesses that help them overcome adversity and, and manage through change? Yeah, Michael, I, I could give you like 7,000 different things, but I'll try to focus on just a couple. <laughs> but it's a, the, I would say one of the primary right. things is that um, the increase in employee listening or the efforts that corporations are making in listening to their employees more often or more strategically is directly correlated to an, to employees feeling like they have a better partnership with their organization, which is becoming increasingly important with partners. Um, so we've we've seen studies where in 2020 and 2021, a dramatic investment within organizations was dedicated towards HR technology and collaboration tools, right? Which was necessary because a lot of people had to suddenly start going to work remote. Now we're seeing that shift dramatically towards digital listening platforms being put in place by organizations because what they've kind of done is created a sense of digital exhaustion from their employees. And as they make changes and potentially disrupt the workforce going forward, the the employers that we consider to be highly competitive are those that are making sure that the changes that they make really specifically align with what an employee wants from their workforce and that they are hitting those unmet needs. We have a study at Mercer called the Unmet Needs Assessment, which is all about measuring trade-offs versus investments. What things would you prefer over other things? Uh, and the companies that we that that tend to be more competitive and tend to have high-performing workforces are those that feel like there's a partnership there um, and that that investment is is truly mutual. Um, uh, as well as the idea of identifying um, uh, uh, the the career path and experience and the skills investment that that companies are making and making sure that they're connecting the desire to teach employees new skills with the incentive or reward or reason why learning those skills are really important for their progress and the company's progress. Yeah, no, that's huge. Those are two very important uh, issues. Um, you know, again, we're, we touched on several of those throughout our series, and uh, you brought on you know, two very important ones as well, uh, Bob. So, uh, Meg, I want to go back to a, a, a topic that you mentioned a minute ago around sort of this idea of a potential economic downturn. Uh, and that's been one of the themes that we've tried to, to come back to time and time again throughout our fall webinar series, uh, helping our clients and, our, and the small business community really think about uh, preparing for that economic downturn or even a recession in the months ahead. So, in light of that, what did our survey indicate uh, were some of the top areas of focus for business leaders going into 23, particularly in light of some of that economic news? 
Yeah, it's interesting uh, because typically what we find um, is that their top priority is driving growth, um, which, you know, makes a ton of sense from a, from a small business perspective. What we found um, they're focusing on right now is really managing operational costs. And this is consistent, again, with um, market level research that, that other experts are out there doing. Um, but our, our clients really, really are focused on how to drive um, value out of every dollar they're putting in to their company and making sure that there's not um, waste anywhere that they're um, that they're able to drive that out of the of the organization. The other things they're thinking about really again very consistently have to do with um, this this tight labor force and you know kind of to Ben's point you know in an era of um, really really difficult recruiting especially if you're focused on high performance you know you know talent uh, in specific areas with with a lot of expertise uh, a lot of times those those recruits or those prospects are gone before you can even get to the point of actually making an offer so um, Clients are really, uh, you know, focused on that. And then a lot of the the uncertainty and the economic, you know, all of those dynamic factors that, that we were speaking about before. So you can see there's a lot of consistency here through the themes that we started um, even at the beginning of the webinar. Yeah, that's right. Bob, I mean, I'd like to get your perspective. Looking at these results, you know, we clearly see that, you know, issues related to managing direct costs are at the forefront. Um, you know, organizations that are, are thinking about managing expenses related to their workforce. Um, yeah. You know, we're in this strange dynamic time of, of there being an employee centric market while also fearing an economic downturn. Right. So, um, you know, how you know, is the threat of an economic recession influencing how executives are viewing this issue? And and, you know, particularly in light of the experiences we've all had over the last few years, what are your thoughts there? It's definitely leading to some anticipation and and projections on how that will adjust the way things are. I'd actually like like you to keep that slide up if you don't mind, Michael, because I, I I love nothing yeah. more than when studies from different organizations build upon each other. And and this is a really <laughs> important slide, I think, because if you look at the top concerns amongst the the respondents here, uh, the labor market is the second highest. Uh, item here. And yet there is, of course, uh, an almost equal concern with inflation, which also then I think ties into are we leading, are we going into a recession uh, economy? We also have studies, and I think it's on slide five, Michael, if you don't mind displaying that. We actually yeah. did interview or, or surveyed series of a series of executives saying, based on what you just went through in 2020 and 2021, where do you plan on investing or retreating if you're faced with an economic downturn? We wrote we wrote it as another economic downturn, though it's important to note that the, the COVID-19 economic downturn was really short. Um, the idea here is we wanted to start to gauge if things start to contract, will that impact the labor market or the, the way that talent are shaping their expectations um, for companies, their demands on flexibility, um, uh, their demands on, on fair compensation, and, and their demands on benefits that address certain things like mental health awareness and, and mental health uh, uh, therapy. And what we've seen is that the actual um, increase in investment seem to be closer to the lines of um, using things like AI and automation to address non-value add work. So not making workers less valuable, but taking junk off of their plate um, and also an increased investment in the reskilling of talent. So basically uh, double da doubling down on the focus into the workforce on we need to make our workforce more competitive. We need to make our workforce more employable and able to grow with our organization. Whereas things along the lines of pulling back on digital transformation, reducing investments in, in health and, and benefits, um, even things like reducing bonus pools and headcounts are quite low on the list comparatively. Um, so we see this as uh, indicative of the fact that we're, we, we are likely going into a recession economy, yet we have this kind of um, unusual talent trend of an, a desire for increased partnership, uh, a desire for uh, greater expectations and, and reputational value within an organization. And we think executives are responding to that in kind by putting talent adjustments on the back burner compared to other adjustments that they can make more readily. 
That's it's fascinating to look at the the analysis and see kind of the trends that we're we're, we're noticing for the year to come. Uh, you know, and and then for you and your team, um, you know, the idea of contingency planning. You know, preparing for uh, the potential of an economic downturn. You know, how are you and your team kind of what are the, the principles or the guiding guiding ideas that you guys use to help kind of think through that as a, as a leadership team and 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 more importantly, how are you thinking about the role of your workforce, the investments you're making in your workforce? you know, helping you kind of think through navigating that situation? Well, while uh, on the macro level, we all may be ex expecting a downturn or a recession, uh, we here at CC3 are very much in growth mode, especially in terms of <laughs> talent. And that may reflect our particular circumstances more than others, but we are full steam ahead. Uh, our telecommunication provider partners have indicated they want us to play a bigger role in their, their strategy. And uh, while it may sound a little foolish to be in expansion mode right now, um, mm. we've found if we can have tough conversations internally uh, during times of plenty, that uh, the changes we make while things are going well can kind of blunt the force of a downturn later on. Um, you know, while we're having this great year, nothing is sacred in terms of what, what's on the table. We've had a maybe a particular position before. Do we even need that? Does that reflect where we need to be, uh, what we want to be doing in the future? So we're full steam ahead, but we're still having those self-critical discussions internally. Nothing is sacred. Uh, how can we be better so that when things go poorly uh, on a macro level, are we already ready? Have we already, you know, had, we've already gone through our diet and, and we're well poised to capitalize on opportunities. Oh, that's so good. And I think that's consistent with the, the sentiments that we found in the survey. We're going to get to that in here in just a minute. But Bob, before we jump into that, I, I know the Mercer team has event, identified some key trends. You referred to them you know, briefly a minute ago. Um, you know, these trends are directly influencing the way that employers and employees you know, sh are relating to one another, how they should be relating to one another to unlock that full potential. Uh, you know, there's some areas, some key areas that every business leader should be thinking through. I'm going to put up a slide. Would you mind sure. unpacking those for us a bit? Yeah, at, at a very high level, I'll, I'll give you uh, a, a description here. So every year we do an evaluation called our global talent trends. Um, and a result of that is it's about 11,000 employees, C-suite executives and senior HR professionals are, are polled on where they see talent progressing over, over in the near term. Um, and then we typically refresh it every year. We've identified five primary trends that we've seen within our responses over the last several years. The first of which is uh, resetting for relevance. This is uh, uh, very tied into um, the relationship and the rep reputation that uh, that uh, organizations have and their ability to connect things like strategy around subjects like ESG and, and DE&I to action within the organization. Working in partnership is really the change in the relationship between employee and employer, the change in that work contract. This is about... Uh, particularly the new generation of employees are redefining the relationship to the point of I, the employee, don't work for you, the employer. We work together. We work in partnership. You invest in me, and similarly, I will invest in you. Uh, total well-being is the um, uh, the concept or bringing in a few different new concepts into how we've typically defined well-being, which, as I mentioned earlier, is along the lines of compensation and benefits and financial security and things like that. Also bringing to the fold the importance of mental health awareness, of mental health uh, therapy, of managers understanding how to address stress and anxiety in the workforce, and then that concept of work flexibility, not just at the level of remote work. There was a question that I wanted to make sure that I addressed because someone did ask along the lines of, okay, I, I mentioned that remote work isn't feasible for a lot of employees. Um, we see this particularly within fields like uh, healthcare, in construction, in energy, in oil and gas, in retail, there isn't a lot of opportunity for people to work remotely from home. So what a lot of companies are having to do is look at the work itself as opposed to the employee's 
placement where they're doing the work. So if you can't work from home, um, you have to look at where, when people are working, what is the work that they're, that they're working on, um, and what type of flexibility are you providing in those kind of two key categories? Is there non-value add work that can be removed that would then provide these employees with greater flexibility? Building for employability is all about skills and making sure that people really understand if I'm going to learn a new skill, here's why, and here's why it's going to benefit me, not just the organization. Uh, and then finally, harness collective energy is my more is the most California of all the trends, I think, because it, but it's also my favorite because it's really the idea or the concept that there is a limited amount of energy that every employee has every day. In their employee experience, what they go through every day, what part of their job is negatively detracting from that energy versus building that energy back up? What's wearing employees out? So this can be just as simple as when someone walks in the building, what do they have to do to get in the building? What do they see when they walk down the hallway? How many programs do they have on their computer that can, quote, bother them? How many different communication channels have been set up where they could be pinged by colleagues all at one time across multiple channels? That'll decrease that energy. So this that's a very high level. As Michael said, I've, I, I can talk about these things for literally hours and sometimes have, but that's a very <laughs> high level overview on those uh, those five trends that we've identified. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. And then I think on the slide deck that, that was just up there, uh, there's a way to download that full report. And uh, for those of you who are asking, we, this this uh, presentation is being recorded and we posted on insperity.com along with the full slide deck. So you should be able to have all access to all of these things that we're talking about here today as well. Um, thanks for walking through that, Bob. It's certainly relevant to many of the things that I know that many business owners are thinking through. Um, but I want to come back to the point that, that Ben made a minute ago, Meg, and that was their, their belief uh, that in spite of whatever the, the predictions may be, they're in growth mode uh, right then. And I think that's, that's a, 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 common, a common theme that we see amongst Insperity's clients. And, and so I want to go back to the survey, Meg, and um, you know, when we, we think about preparing for a potential economic downturn, we're seeing how Insperity clients are rather bullish on where they're going. And I, and I think that's where uh, the sentiments that, that that Ben communicated there. What did, what did the survey uh, share us, share with us there? Yeah, this is actually one of my favorite findings from this particular wave of the survey that we did. Um, we asked about um, how our clients were expecting the economic situation to impact their organization over the next year. And you can see that a lot of our, our clients are actually facing themselves for at least somewhat of a negative impact um, in 20, going into 2023. So over half um, are saying it's either going to be, you know, somewhat or significantly negative impact to their organization. Um, but, you know, we also asked about their their outlook and how they feel they're going to be able to navigate and, and the um, ex expected performance for their organization going forward. And you can see that the scale completely flips and that most of our clients, 75%, are still expecting to perform better. Um, so this really goes to, and we didn't plan this, <laughs> but it really goes to mm -hmm. that sense of resilience and the, the level of confidence that, you know, despite some of these challenges, you know, these are not fair weather organizations. They they feel that they are doing the things they need to do in order to weather the storm, um, even not knowing what that storm is going to necessarily look like. Um, and I think that this is just such a great story um, in terms of, um, you know, it's not always going to be easy. So, you know, the ability to set yourself up to be successful through the through the hard times, I think, is a great story. Yeah. Ben, you, you offered some context on that a minute ago. Anything more you'd want to add just around kind of your perspective on, on looking at these results and how that resonates with you and your team? You know, we, we are cautiously optimistic, as I mentioned before, we're, we're in growth mode. Uh, not so much worried about macro issues as alignment with those other companies that are uh, essential to our success. We sell other people's services and products and we support those. So while we don't have maybe the clarity that we'd always like because we're so dependent on uh, these third parties, um, 
we think we've got some very encouraging indications from them that they want us to play a bigger role uh, in, in their path going forward. And we're, we're trying to capitalize on that. So we're, we're cautiously optimistic and acting accordingly. Yeah, that's great. So I want to go back to the survey again, uh, Megan. There's just so much rich information here that I want to I want to unpack a little bit more on this idea of where we talked about this idea of being in an employee centric labor market, and you know the idea of the, the, it's becoming exceedingly unclear that the complexities of being an employer, you know, particularly if you're trying to be an employer of choice, you know, these are more pronounced than ever. So when we asked, what did Insperity clients say uh, when we asked them about the top human resource related concerns that they have going into 2023? Yeah, it's such a great question, and I'm actually going to circle back around to something um, or several things that Bob was talking about earlier. Um, you know, the the maintaining and building a strong culture is um, really the the top of mind issue for um, our clients, and you know, there's so much that goes into that the the listening, the meeting employees where they are, the making sure that you are. Um, you know, make, that they understand that the skills that you are asking them to build, um, that they realize their own benefit inside of that. The way that employees have, have been thinking about their their careers even and the things that they're trying to do um, has really, really changed. It's very much less um, employer-centric and very much more about what do I need to do to manage my career, to build the skills that I need to set up my life so that I am in control of my professional destiny, right? Um, and one of the things that that Bob had talked about was, um, you know, the, the different ways of listening to employees. And this is something that we've invested in, um, you know, even in a, in a um, significant way in the last year. We've really revamped the way that we listen to our employees and we've launched a Voice of the Employee initiative. And one of the things that we focus on that I think is really important for people to think about is um, in order for employees to feel heard and understand that the things that you're doing link back to their feedback, you actually have to be very articulate and intentional about making those connections for employees. So it's not good enough just to listen to them and then act on it. You have to continue to communicate. We heard you. And so now here's the thing that we're doing based on this piece of of feedback that we've we've heard from you. And um, that's a really easy thing to miss. And it can make employees feel like um, the, the effort and time that they've put into providing that kind of feedback isn't really being um, leveraged. So I wanted to make that point. But in terms of the other things that our clients are looking at, you know, obviously they're struggling with compensation. There's this, this dynamic again of I need to manage my costs, but wow, you know, this labor market is really something else. And, um, you know, the, the um, compensation that high performing individuals can command is pretty significant. So how do I balance that? And, you know, I think Bob spoke really well to some of the, um, you know, kind of broader considerations around designing jobs and, and work in a way that um, isn't 100% compensation based, but there's a lot of other uh, considerations there. And then, uh, you know, manage, we talked already about uh, managing costs, obviously healthcare costs are a huge part of that. Uh, and then employee well-being and wellness. This is really, really top of mind, particularly for millennials and Gen Zs. Um, you know, the, the the comfort level in talking about, you know, complete well-being, mental health, um, stress in the workplace, burnout. Um, these 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 younger employees are more and more comfortable with that every day, um, and it's something that they have really high expectations for for their employers. So those are the exact types of things that that our clients are continuing to um, have to address as well. Yeah, really, in really interesting. Uh, Bob, any any reflections on that? And, and I want to dive a little bit more into the, the talent question, particularly around the notion of the great resignation. But any reflections on this slide, any of the results that you see that are interesting to you? Yeah, I, I, I think this is really very, very close to what we're seeing as well within the market. Um, I also want to address uh, a question that, that came through in the chat that I think is is uh, relevant to this as well. When we look at what it is that we offer employees in order to convince them to either remain with an organization or join the organization in the first place? There's a question here about, should we look into certain ancillary benefits? And I think there is some value there. 
Uh, particularly when you look at certain, I'll throw out stuff like like uh, I've seen uh, companies throw out talk space uh, uh, memberships or calm memberships or things like that that can help address kind of the the stress and anxiety that we hear about in the workforce that many of us experience ourselves. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is that benefits is one uh, slice of the pie. It's not the entire pie. And there are several other things that we need to address as well in order to convince uh, employees to join the organization. And, and so we talk about the great resignation, right? At Mercer, we don't call it that we, because we like to be different. We call it the great negotiation <laughs> because we think that uh, the great resignation implies that you've got a lot of employees that are just bailing on you. But we actually think it's a lot more conversational than that. Um, and we think that employees are actually making it pretty clear about what it is that they want for an organization. And if they feel like an organization isn't listening to them, then they will find another opportunity to gain that. And I'll give you an example. So um, I was speaking with a client that is um, uh, an airline and they have a lot of uh, people that they hire as baggage handlers. And they've been experiencing a ton of gaps, a ton of labor shortages in this area. And, in, and one of the biggest problems that they have is absenteeism, which has b- become a big problem with a lot of organizations. But what that really means, and, and absenteeism is in the sense that they make a job offer to somebody and that person never shows for the job. And what they're seeing in a lot of these cases is that these employees have gone over to Target or Walmart or something like that because the pay is similar, but not only are they inside instead of being out on a hot tarmac or a freezing tarmac, you know, all day long and and working a job that's very dangerous, um, they're also getting the availability to do more things during the day than they would do as a baggage handler, taking and loading onto a plane. If you work at Target, you can work a bunch of different departments. You can do a bunch of different jobs every day. So it's not just compensation and benefits are really important. Don't get me wrong, but it's also the variety of work. And that really ties into what I think the key thing that companies that are combating what we call the great negotiation or the great resignation is that companies that provide visibility or transparency to to their employees about what you can do here and where you can go here is really, really valuable, particularly for the young generation that's come in and had a really bizarre experience their few first few years at work um i saw a comment in the chat about yeah we're seeing a lot of a lot of gen z come back to the office because they haven't had the opportunity to be in the office for two years yeah we're seeing that too gen z came back in droves when they had the opportunity to return to a workplace so providing that transparency that career path here's the type of work you can do here's how we're going to invest in you Here's how you can grow and here's where you can go in this position Um, from here. If you can provide that type of visibility from the onboarding perspective, I think you're going to see some really dramatic increases in those employees remaining with the organization and similarly investing in your organization. Yeah. Uh, Ben, I want to get your perspective on that. This, I I think this notion of having uh, flexibility and options and the type of work that you're doing uh, engagement and, and being able to bring uh, uh, exciting and new things to the table uh, for people to feel like they can grow within their career. How, how does that resonate with you and, and the CC3 team? Yeah, uh, I interpreted this uh, question initially in terms of uh, remote and hybrid work. And as I said, we, we've we shied away from that mm-hmm. to touch on what uh, Bob mentioned. I think that people are really anxious to have a sense of community. Uh, and a set of values uh, with their employer. And so from an onboarding perspective, or really just an interviewing perspective, we found that that first call, that first interaction with a potential employee is so important. Is the voice on the other end of the line friendly? Um, Is the company very upfront about what what the job is? so yeah, what what Bob said really resonates with with me as well as uh, this idea of progression. We are a very small company, uh, about seventy people, but you know even much less uh, up until fairly recently. And we thought our pitch to uh, employees was, "Hey, we're very small, we're very growing. Who knows, you know, what you could be doing in this company going mm-hmm. forward?" 
you know, while that might be appealing to some, people want a more concrete progression, a more concrete path. How do I get from A to B to C? And uh, we put more of an emphasis on that. You really have to to spell it out for people. Uh, and we think that we've, we're have we better than we used to be uh, in terms of outlining, here's what your career could look like with us. And we hope you never leave us. But even if you do, we think that we can uh, provide you with a lot of skills that you could take going forward in your life. I think that gets back to that question of, of trust and seeing the idea of culture being the, the top thing that, that people are, are concerned about. I mean, what you just described is a culture that really uh, identifies the value of every individual and a, an investment into them and their future. And uh, I think by doing that, you're, you're indicating the, you know, the, the, the power and the potential of what a tremendous company culture can do. Um, Bob, I want to, as we're beginning to wrap up our session here, I want to come back to you. You talked earlier about this idea of, of kind of redefining some terms, not the great resignation, but the great negotiation. I think that's how you phrased it. We also have another one that's sort of in this work-life balance idea that has been in some ways completely turned on its head over the last few yes. years. Uh, the Mercer team has thought about this idea, something more akin to work-life integration, right? So um, there's a lot of interesting things that you guys have studied about around energy, and you talked about that a minute ago. Um, what closing thoughts would you offer to us about you know, this issue of work-life integration you know, going into the new year and the challenges that are ahead? Well, I, I would first say that I, I really love what Ben just said about um, the investment that we make in employees, even if in the long term you don't remain with us for 30 years. But we're going to place that investment. We're going we're gonna to attract you in here. We're going to invest in you. We're going to help you grow. You're going to become a more marketable, more employable uh, member of society, if you will. I think that that is a fantastic mm -hmm. attitude uh, and really realistic because uh, we're probably not going to have a lot of employees who remain with the company for 40 years. That's just not the way I think the world works anymore. Uh, and so being realistic about that, I think, is really valuable. But to your point about work-life balance mm -hmm. and work-life integration. So work-life balance was this buzzword that was thrown around for decades that I, I always personally found really amorphous and and impossible to identify because I think it's so personal. Um, and and so because of that, Mercer uh, has started thinking more along the lines of how does work and life integrate together? Because the lines have blurred so much, particularly as a result of the pandemic, where a lot of people were working down the hall from where they sleep, hopefully not in the same room that they slept in, but down the hall from where they slept. And what we really ask our clients to think about when it comes to their employees' experience um, and when it comes to work-life integration is when they're working, what is it that you can do to make their work experience easier? Um, and a lot of people say, well, so what's like, what's the low-hanging fruit there? And I say, it in my opinion, it begins with the systems that you're providing to employees. So I did a focus group. Uh, months ago, and and we were talking about the communication platforms that this client has for their employees, and they'd integrated a bunch of these collaboration tools. And I asked the question of, hey, so tell me, how does this help you? Or what what is your reaction to the implementation of these tools? And I had a guy stand up and say, we have five new ways of communicating to me. So there are now five ways for me to be irritated by my coworkers that I didn't have before. <laughs> so that type of idea of are the solutions that we're putting in place for these employees helping them get through the day and get their job done better? Mercer's done studies that show that in some cases to perform a certain HR related function, you sometimes have to go to seven or eight different systems in order to get that done. That's the kind of stuff when it comes to work-life integration where you can make the work part of that a lot easier by mapping out what someone has to do to perform a task. So when it comes to low hanging fruit, what's the kind of stuff that we can address right away? I typically sit down with my clients and I say, let's map out what your employees have to do to perform X. Um, there's not a whole lot that I think a, a company can directly do to impact life experience or their consumer experience um, other than providing them with uh, those types of benefits and compensation that can enhance those parts of their business. But when it comes to the employee experience, I think there's a lot that a company can do to determine where are we causing dis like disruption or a loss of time or wasted time because we've put so many different 
blockades or steps in place in order to perform a certain task. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I love this slide. I love the concepts behind what you're talking about, um, simplifying, removing those friction points, ultimately kind of integrating this whole, this whole notion. Um, it's a really, there's a lot of stuff here and a lot of good content and, and we just don't have enough time to cover it all. But thank you, Bob, for, for diving into that with us. Um, sure. We appreciate your partnership um, and the insights that you and the team bring. Meg, thank you to your team for, for uncovering these insights from our clients. And we look forward to doing more of these kind of studies in the, in the year ahead and adjusting, you know, kind of getting those insights as the, as the economy uh, takes the turns that it will. And, and then thank you to you and your team for entrusting us to, to partner with you through this. And, and uh, it's, our, it's our honor to be able to continue to do that. So we appreciate that uh, very much. Um, thank you to, to all of you and uh, those of you who have joined us here. Um, you know, there, there is certainly a lot of value in being able to lift up our heads and, and take a look at the broader landscape as we consider you know, the steps that we can take to care for our businesses um, as we plan ahead. But more importantly, we, when we hear, as I said a minute ago, when we hear from our Insperity clients on their outlook for the future, we listen because we know that there's no better representative sample of the best businesses in America than the clients that we serve. Uh, over the last several months, the, this series has sought to touch on some pretty important themes, things focusing on you know, ways to help you potentially recession-proof your business, but also offering some necessary considerations should a reduction in force need to be considered. We talked about fighting this good fight in this unprecedented war for talent that we're presently facing. We talked about the importance of upskilling and reskilling your, your existing workforce. And again, building a culture that thrives around that idea of continuous learning and development. And we, we also talked about this idea of wrestling with the realities of inflation and growing wages and, and the employee expectations that are coming with that. And finally today, we took a look back at the year of 2022 and, and reflected on the lessons we learned, but also looked ahead uh, to see the, the, the dynamic environment that we have, uh, full of change and yet also full of opportunity. So if you'd like to review any of these sessions, uh, let me invite you to visit insperity.com and visit the resources section on our website to access the on-demand replays of this entire series that we've done throughout the fall and to explore a wealth of additional information on the topics most relevant to business leaders today. As I mentioned, this session will be is being recorded and we posted there later this afternoon along with the slide deck that's been uh, shared here today. And in closing, I would just like to say as we approach the holiday season, on behalf of the Insperity family, allow me to extend our deepest gratitude to you and for the resilience that you have shown through these most challenging of times. And we name the series based on that because we see this innate quality within our clients, you know, folks who we regard as true heroes for the work that you do and the care that you show for your people and your customers and your community. So thank you for allowing us the privilege of standing shoulder to shoulder with you during these times. And you know, we have confidence that we will be there no matter what uh, may come in the year ahead. So thanks for joining us for today's Business Resiliency Series webcast. We hope you and your family have a wonderful holiday season, and we look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.